thought I'd explain real quick kind of the genesis of this material. Back in 2009, I had uh, an opportunity to start about five years working with young men in the summer months, training them to preach. Oddly enough, the first one of those um, candidates and interns and maybe victims was Dan Lankford, that many of you know. As I prepared for that, I, uh, I had been out of that training session place for about 11 years, and I sent out feelers for books, what would be some great books, because one of the things we did was we read a book every week. And this book was recommended to me. It was called Crucial Conversations. Um, and this is not a religious book, by the way. Has anybody read this book, by the way? A couple of you, maybe. Uh, it, it is not a faith-based book. It is completely a data-driven book that some business guys sat down and decided, how do we communicate more effectively? And I will admit to you that at times it's somewhat difficult to read because it gets kind of technical and bogged down, but it had some really valuable stuff in it. And so every summer for five years, I read this book with my interns. They read it. I perused it because I'd read it once. And then we would discuss it. And uh, then about a couple years ago, a friend of mine, David Banning, who writes a lot of high school class material, told me that he had adapted this book to some class material. And so that sat in the back of my mind for a year or so. And so about uh, three quarters ago, we actually started a 13-lesson class on crucial conversations, mainly using David's material that then I adapted for us. And it goes over. And what's interesting is just some biblical principles that we'll see today that this book is incorporated without really understanding its biblical principles. And so as it came time for uh, us to uh, plan today and, and to be here together today, uh, this was just a topic that I had sent to the elders as a possibility, and uh, they were in agreement with that. Now, when we talk about crucial conversations, by the way, what we're really talking about is this idea that there are three parts to a crucial conversation. The first of those is there will be opposing opinion. So We're talking about conflict, in other words. And a big part of this will be conflict resolution. There will be strong emotions, because whenever there's conflict, there are strong emotions. Uh, I, I'm assuming there's probably a lot of Kentucky fans or Louisville fans here today. There's probably not that many Tennessee fans here today. There's one, and, and, uh, and my, maybe two, and my, and my buddy Boatwright, who we're all thinking about, is not here, but that's, that's the, the love of Jesus did not bind us initially as quick as the love of the Tennessee Vols, but then the love of Jesus has gotten stronger between me and Boatwright, thinking about him this morning. And then finally, high stakes, because these conversations have a lot of risk involved, okay? So then, this is your first Slido, and there's another QR code. Who are you most likely then to have those kind of conversations with this week? Who is it this week you're going to get into some conversation with that is somebody who the emotions are going to be a strong, you're probably going to disagree, and uh, there's a lot at risk. So if you want to answer with your phone, that's fine. If you'd rather answer in person, that's fine. So your wife, okay, I've got wife here. Uh, anybody besides our wives? I, somebody told me, Grant told me, his wife told me yesterday after I talked about this, that it would be good for him to hear about communication, which uh, my response was, yeah, it would be good for the wives to hear too, uh, but this is a men's day. Uh, so we have here my wife, my kids, uh, a user at work, security team at work, co-workers, so workers, wife, anybody else to add to that mix besides those initial things? Okay. Right. That's what I figured by user, that's your terminology. Right.
Yeah. In, yep. The, the text issue, that sometimes we have a problem with text versus face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice interactions. With text, you can't you can read the wrong tone. We'll talk about that in the third session, uh, something about that. I also have fellow Christians up here. That's good. Um, anybody ever have any high stakes conversations with elders? That ever happened? And just about every conversation an elder finds himself in, guess what, is a crucial conversation. Uh, so uh, pretty much the answers, family members, coworkers, people at church, could be neighbors over some kind of neighbor dispute. Uh, you're going to find yourself in a lot of situations and sometimes we don't expect them. Here's the next question. Uh, let's see, there it is. Do you think you handle crucial conversations well? This is an easy, this is an easy yes or no question. So we'll see what it is. Do you think you handle crucial conversations well? I got a lot of yeses so far. So we have, we're kind of close to 50-50, real close to 50. Uh, and so the, the reality is, I think sometimes, for me personally, I would answer this as no. Even though I've taught this material before, uh, and I've read this book or reviewed it about six or seven times now. In fact, this is one of those books Dan and I have talked about before. It's one of those books about every year or two, you have to go back and at least review to remind yourself, whoa, here's the things I need to fix. Because... Over and over again, I find myself sliding back into bad habits. Yep. Sure. Handling a conversation well does not mean that you got your way. That's not what we're talking about. That's the key. That's a great point to bring up. You had your hand up. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to play you a clip, it's almost three minutes, of a, it's just a Thursday when I was driving into the office, I listen to a lot of sports podcasts, I live in Alabama, but I'm a Tennessee guy, so I listen to Tennessee sports news the day after, it's actually broadcast on, sport, on, on podcast, to stay up on the Titans and all, and this is a, a podcast I listen to called A to Z Sports, it's, it's about the Titans. The Titans have a seventh draft pick. Some of you aren't sports fans. I'm just telling you, that's a really big deal for us, trying to figure out who we're going to take. And, and these two guys are having a discussion. Uh, at the heart of it is this player at uh, Notre Dame, and they didn't send enough people in this one guy's mind, and they didn't meet with him. And so there's this question. Now, I want you not to get so bogged down in the minutia of this, but I want you to listen to the way they're communicating. Because it's interesting a couple times what a guy's going to say, and then we'll talk about it. So hopefully this works. Drills. This more is valuable. A, Real quick, what's more valuable at a pro day? A wide receiver's pro day or a left tackle's pro day? I think the answer to both those questions is the dinner. I want afterwards. you to pick one. I don't. I don't want. I asked a question with two opportunities. Fence riding. No. Which one is more important in your opinion as a pro pro day position? Wide receiver or left tackle? On on the field. Are you asking I said me pro the day? Field? I said pro I, day. It's the dinner afterwards. It's the dinner afterwards. Like, what do you mean? More, like, 
There I'm is asking no you, you have two choices, you Austin. Get off the fence. It's two two choices. Just answer the question. Whatever your opinion is. What's it can more be whatever you think. Enough. I don't care. But I, in your opinion, do you want me to say the question yes, again? Or ask the question understand? again, please. In your opinion, what is more important? What position is more important for that pro day? Wide receiver or left tackle? Um, I would probably say the offensive lineman, actually. Because <laughs> and that's fine. Because the wide because the wide receiver is doing things on air more than and you're gonna see route running and all that stuff, but it's so easy to do that. I think where the offensive lineman you're gonna see more about that is the footwork up close and personal and seeing just how powerful they can be. But again, the point is, I don't give a d- about on-field drills at a pro day. My whole point is the dinner afterwards. That's I just what I appreciate I want. you answering the question. That's fine. okay, whatever. Like, but again, I don't care. Like, to answer your question, I don't care about your question. You always don't answer. care about my question. That's why you never answer my question. And I got always here ask. and ask you four times about yeah. the question. You always say I don't care about your question. That's fine. But you never answer it the first time. I always got to ask it four times because you don't want to answer it. Because you ask me irrelevant questions to the point that I'm making. It's a show. <laughs> it's a conversation. You can ask, ask me anything, Austin. Ask it, me a question. Sounds more like a married couple. To me. Right? Because here's this whole, you never answer my questions. Right? What, why does, what is going on there? Like, we laugh about that, but what's going on? I have any thoughts about that? What's really happening? It's an argument. By the way, I don't know if this qualifies as a crucial conversation, but it's a great illustration. Yeah. As a light, as a Titans fan, it is left back. If you don't know that, then you're not a Titans fan. Yes. Sir. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes, but so the guy asking the questions in the blue shirt, the guy in the black shirt's Austin, the guy in the blue shirt, Zach, Austin's kind of a punk. I'm just going to tell you, if you ever listen to this, you just, there's times you just going to punch Austin to the throat, the guy, uh, because he routinely is one of these, I don't care what you think, this is the right way, which by the way, is a really bad way to enter into any conversation. It's one of the things we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, they're not listening to each other. And and, and to be clear, what's at stake is one of them is trying to say, well, what, which positions, because it comes down to, for the Titans that don't understand, there's two positions really in the first round if they stay at this pick. And Joe Alt's the best left tackle in the, in, the, in the country, and anybody who's a diehard Titans fan wants them to draft Joe Alt because we need that more than anything else, okay? But the problem is, is the guy in the, Austin, the guy in the black shirt, says, pro day doesn't matter. It's the dinner afterwards where you get to interview the guy. You get this private one-on-one time to see what kind of guy he is. And the guy in the blue shirt's asking a question about, well, which is more important to watch, a wide receiver doing drills on the field or a left tackle at their pro day? Which, by the way, the answer is wide receiver because left tackle can't do anything. They're not really blocking anybody. It's dumb, okay? But his whole point is, what's more important on the field? And the other guy is saying, it's, it's, it's what happens afterwards. They're not even in the same conversation. Right, but the the problem is his answer is not the question. And by the way, the easier thing here is to answer the question and then continue after the question saying, but here's what I think about this. That's actually what good conversation would be. This is not a good conversation because they're not listening to each other. 
And as somebody said, they're, they're trying to react rather than respond. What's the difference in those two? Part of this is sports radio without this is boring. Yeah. Right. Right. One of my closest friends is a preacher in Tampa, Florida, Edwin Crozier, and he and I, my wife has overheard us, we will have really intense debates, arguments, and then the switch flips, like, how the kids, and everything's fine. My wife's like, how are you guys friends? You're so mean to each other. I mean, we're sitting there going, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, how could you believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a limp? That's stupid. You're an idiot. Like, that's and I know you're not supposed to call people idiot, but uh, listen, it's just we do that, and and then again, it's just like, hey, everything good? Is good? Yep, what's going on? Because there's certain people you give credit to are allowed to do that, and other ones aren't. But the problem is when you take that home, when you do that with your wife, it doesn't you, <laughs> does not work ever. Uh, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Yeah. He finally answered the question. Yeah. 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 And that's just them all the time. Okay, let's transition here for a minute. This is this is your last slide of question for this presentation. Can you think of any conversations in scripture where there was a lot at stake, probably some strong emotions? What are some texts where we see these kinds of not the sports talks thing, but where you imagine it got pretty heated. So Galatians 2. Yep, I would say that's one, for sure. Acts, oh, Paul and Barnabas, sorry, Acts 13, yeah. Uh, Galatians 2 is another one with Paul and Peter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Acts 15 with, with John Mark. Okay. Yeah, it is, but it's it, it doesn't meet the standard of what we're looking at here. Like, okay. Anybody else? Jesus and Judas. Okay. But it's interesting that what we're going to use as a major text in a few moments, nobody's put up here. It's going to be in the second session. So, But I'll go ahead and tell you, Acts 15 to me is a huge crucial. We'll talk about why that is. That's going to become our main text for the morning. But Acts 15 is a turning point in the church. I'm not talking about Paul and Barnabas. I'm talking about what we often call the Jerusalem. And there's a lot of things in Acts 15 in the next session that we'll see that really do play a, a role and help us to understand um, this idea of crucial conversations together. Um, let, me, let me say that there's some passages, there's lots of passages, oh, uh, there's lots of passages in Scripture uh, that deal with some principles about communication, that we routinely violate these principles 
when we get in discussions with our wife, especially. Uh, so let's do this. Let's, let's read these. Uh, I'd love to have people just volunteer to read them. Um, just read them nice and loud. So let's start with Ephesians 4.29. Um, and if you want to like skip ahead to Colossians 4 to be ready, that's fine as well. But let's, uh, let's read these and maybe talk about some things here uh, briefly about the principles. So Ephesians 4.29, who, who wants to read that? Nice and loud. Okay. Uh, Phil, I saw your hand. Okay, so how are we at that? I, you know, I use the example of me and Edwin when I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Is that, is that edifying conversation? I mean, I, I think maybe. Uh, no, it's not, right? I mean, do we, ever, do we ever get in those conversations where we respond in ways that are maybe corrupt forms of communication? That's, that's the problem is the emotion. I, I'll tell you the story of the cat door real quick. We had a cat. I don't like cats unless they're in barbecue sauce, by the way. So, uh, But we had a cat, uh, and my wife loved this cat, but we had a cat door she wanted to put in. By the way, it's an awful idea when you have a cat who's a hunter like ours was because I think I took out two half-dead baby rabbits, four or five birds flying around my house. This cat would bring things in, but they weren't dead yet. And it became my job to finish the job, which is when the cat door started getting locked. So it's my job to install this cat door. I take the cat door, I take the big door off the hinges, I lay it down, I'm cutting a hole for the cat door. My wife is watching me and she's going, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Like, what are you talking about? And then she said, my dad would have done it. And I looked at my wife and said, then call your dad to come get the cat. That was not the way to handle that. On either side, right? Uh, because what happened is our emotions quickly got involved. And because they got involved so quickly, we said things that weren't gracious to each other. Violated Ephesians. What about Colossians 4 6? Colossians 4 6. Seasoned with salt. It's kind of funny because when I read this language to the high school kids, I have to point out like salty here does not mean what you think salty is today. See, high school kids are, I think that's uncool, by the way. I think we've already moved past that. There was a time that salty means that you were like, Difficult, a little bitter. This is the kind of salty is the idea of good flavor, that you use speech that is flavored. We don't do that very well in these kind of conversations. James 1, 19 and 20. Look at that one. This is a big one. James 1, verse 19. Here, the school will How are y'all doing with that? Yeah, usually the answer to that is no. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, you know, somebody said one time, if your mouth is moving, your ears aren't working. And uh, this passage is powerful because we're supposed to slow down every part of our processing except 
right? The, the, the hearing. You're supposed to be eager listening. You know, we, we think about that clip I played. It's hard to hear somebody when you're talking to them. Um, I'm not so sure we need to go as far as the talking stick thing where you can only talk if you hold the stick. If that's kind of what I laugh about, you know. But there is a part here where we all know that we're supposed to be slow to react. Quick to hear. And we generally, I mean, I, I don't do a good job with that a lot of times with my kids, my wife, in any situation. People love to be around. Yeah, that could be helpful. Um, one of the issues we have, too, though, is we don't like awkward silence. You ever notice that? So we, we want to start talking as soon as they finish talking, so much so that sometimes we interrupt them when they're at a comma instead of a period. And so we sit there with this awkward pregnant pause, and we're like, somebody's got to talk. Even if we don't have anything to say, then we can sit here. And uh, so one of the things we got to do is train ourselves to be able to accept awkward silence at times. Because that's what listening is. That's what listening is. Proverbs 7, uh, yeah, go ahead. One of my favorite passages. Notice what that second verse said. Even a fool looks what? How? Keeps his mouth shut. We have all doubt. Yep. 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 And, and the one who has knowledge, by the way, is told here to have what kind of spirit? So what is that? He's, he's so cool. What? He, yeah. Yeah. It, to me, it's that idea of let your speech always be seasoned with salt. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse 23. So this gets back to the emotion. When I let my anger get a hold of me. That causes me a lot of trouble. Uh, and one of the things, I, I skipped this slide earlier, but one of the things that I think you've got to realize is we usually are at our worst with those we love the most. Like, there are ways in my past that I have spoken to my wife and would not speak to anybody else. Which, by the way, is not how that should be. That's just how we are sometimes. Um, and, and that's just not the way we should act. Because anger is a big issue. The emotions are a big issue. Proverbs 10, verse 19. So here we've got this warning of a lot of words. I think about the sports clip. There's a lot of words said. You know, when I was listening to that driving to my office the other day, it wasn't until I actually downloaded the audio and made the clip, edited the one word I had to edit out that you probably noticed, that I realized that whole thing took almost three minutes. And, and how, you know, it took three minutes to get to one simple answer. How many words were 
that's how a lot of our conversations really are. Um, Proverbs 12, verse 18. The ESV, by the way, says the tongue of the wise brings One guy that uses his tongue like a what? Sword. Another guy that goes for what? How do you want to be? Which guy do you want to be versus which guy do you think you are? That's, you can be, yeah, we can be both. Depends on the day, uh, all the external. Yeah, yeah, if you're the one wielding the sword, it's really hard to do what I do. Have you ever have you ever done something at home? Injured your family, and then you sit down. One of the things that our our family has always done is we eat together dinner every night. It's it's even if it's leftovers, you sit down at the table and eat together. It's a thing that we, my wife and I, have done. Um, no regrets there, but I can tell you there's been times where I have had interactions with my kids or with my wife not been the way I should handle something. We sit down and before I can even pray, I just have to look at them and go, I need to tell y'all I was wrong. I, I really missed it. And I need to ask you. There comes a time and I, and I do that hopefully to heal, I realize, but I do that because comes a time where sometimes you have to just sit down and say, I use my mouth as a weapon. We should be humble enough to realize that and to acknowledge it. By the way, regardless of what you do, whether we're a father or a supervisor or a director or a teacher or an elder or a preacher or whatever, All right, let me say this. There's, we'll close with this, and then we'll take a short break. Um, three responses to crucial conversations. One, we can just avoid them. And I, and I think there's part of this sometimes. Some of this depends on your personality, okay? Uh, I'm a big believer in your personality. It plays a big role in how you respond to things. I'm very type A, which means um, if I see a crucial conversation ahead, this is my last option. I mean, I'm ready to go. Okay. And it and it doesn't matter what the conversation's about. I'm ready to enter the conversation. That's just my personality. My wife is very introverted. That's not who she is. And there's a lot of times she would just rather not talk about it. Just not even have the conversation. Uh, and so that's that's one of the things. But one of the problems is that one of the greatest enemies of communication in this area is the amount of time between whatever happens. And when you actually talk about it. Because a lot of times what happens is that lag between the two creates kind of a greater separation that is more difficult to overcome. And in the absence, by the way, in the absence of actually having that conversation, you allow other things to enter in. You allow things like gossip to enter in. This is when my wife and I will sit down with um, young couples and counsel them, some premarital, some post-marital with issues. And one of the things that comes up sometimes is talking about, listen, when you have a problem with your husband or your wife, 
you don't go tell your parents about that. You don't talk to your parents about that. But here's the deal. If you, if you have a problem with your wife and you don't deal with it and it sits there for a week before you actually discuss it, the problem is you're going to want to discuss it with somebody. And that's when it's going to end up leading down a path that is negative. You're going to, this, is, this is when your wife calls her mom and tells, by the way, here's the reason why you never do this. Tells her mom how awful you are, or you tell your mom how awful she is. It can go both ways. And then the next week, you guys sit down and talk about it, and you're all fine, and, and you move on because you love each other. And the whole time after that, what's going on? For the next six months, that mother-in-law hates the other one because they mistreated their baby, and they can't let it go. And you move past it, but because of that not dealing with it, and the gossip that happened in the middle of that lag time, you've created more difficulty in that. That's huge. And that's why one of the things about avoidance is it actually creates more problems. You had your hand up. Yeah, but a cooling off period needs to be brief. It's not a week. I can see going, give me 30 minutes to clear my head and calm down and we'll come back. I can see, and by the way, one of the passages we did not read is there is this biblical principle that you do not go to bed angry. It, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. That's something that married couples need to realize. Hey, if it's 10 o'clock at night and you all get in a fight, you may need a cooling off period, but you should have that discussion before you go to bed. Why? You ever done that where you go to bed and you try to sleep? And, you're, and I've had this. Like, we didn't talk, and I'm mad at her, and she's mad at me. And we're over there in our king size bed because we don't like to touch. I need covers. She doesn't need covers, that whole thing. Plus, we have CPAPs. We don't need to get our hoses rolled up on and all that stuff. So we're over there. I'm facing one direction. She's facing another direction. Neither one of us is sleeping. We're not talking to each other. And the whole time I'm like, I can't believe she can just go to sleep thinking everything's okay. She's got such a cold, dark heart. She's thinking the same thing about me. And then you wake up the next morning, what happens? Every little, she cannot cough without making you mad, right? You, you got you to gotta have the conversation. Avoidance always causes more problems. Back in the booth. Yeah, hopefully that works, but not always. Uh, yeah, Harold? I'm, I'm sorry. Harold, y'all look too, too much alike. Sorry. I mean, your brothers, so. Have you all ever had crucial conversation? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's going to be third session. That's huge. It's called telling yourself a story. Right? And I will tell you that that, because I think it's the most powerful thing You don't have to wait to do that. But this thing, we end up telling our thing, we end up making this story in our head that may or may not be true. Okay? And we'll see that in the third session. Um, here's another thing about avoidance, when it's not your wife. Matthew 18 is in Scripture for a reason. Like when you know there's a problem with somebody, what are you supposed to do? Go talk to them. I've been preaching now for, I think, 26 years. I will tell you that one of the least practiced pastors in the church is Matthew 18. Because what happens is when we have a problem with somebody, we're too, we're too scared to talk about it. But, but if it gets to be too much on our mind, we don't mind going straight to the eldership about them when we've never talked. And listen, i got to tell you, one of the things I found out is when I practice Matthew 18, the way Jesus said, go to them, that's never not worked. It's never not worked to go to somebody. I've never had somebody so far, when I had the courage to go sit down and go, hey, this happened, I don't know if you knew this, but this is what happened, this is how it felt. I've never had them say, but the avoidance causes problems. Uh, let's move on. Secondly, we can handle them poorly, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, when it matters most, we are at our worst. 
That's rough. So one of the things that the book talks about, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about, but when it comes to conversations, you have the same chemical reactions that you have in a physical conversation, which is fight or flight. You have the same chemical reactions in conversation, that adrenaline rush of fight or flight that you have in physical so what happens is you get amped up. That's what causes the emotions, the reaction, the charge. And you either run away, don't handle it, or you fight. You fight to the death because you are convinced that in a physical conflict that your life is absolutely dependent on you. Those chemicals, man, if, if you've ever been in that situation and realize it, it, it it's a drug. I mean, it, it takes over your body and your mouth and your mind. It drives you. And, and, and it's something that we just need to be aware of. Sometimes we don't know where to start, so we start at the wrong place. Sometimes we don't listen, but we, tap, we just handle them poorly. And we respond in ways that are destined for failure. I mean, how many times we know we tell our kids to never use the word never? Or say never. You get in an argument with your wife, and one of the first things you say is, well, you never, there's a story in the Bible that that language is used. Um, the story of the prodigal son. You remember when the older brother comes back, and he goes, what's all this commotion about? The father tells him, you remember what he says? You've never done this for me, and I have never disobeyed you. Now for those of us who are parents, do you believe that's a true statement? It's an impossible statement. Impossible. That, that older son, even though he stayed, and he did what he should do, all those things, to say that I never disobeyed your command, that's an absolute lie. We know when we say that stuff we're wrong. I'm 49, I've been married for 26 years, I still let the word never slip into my conversation. We just handle these conversations. The last thing is simple. It is the H word of the day. That's where we're going to pause. We're going to take a, a break. I get to this. And then we'll come back. And, uh, we'll talk about what that looks like. I've been challenged by Foster to let us out early today. Uh, know if that's going to happen, but if I do, um, Foster's behind that, not me, so you can think with me, okay? So, real quick. Well, I was going to say, if I don't listen in some way, that's probably going to cause a different truth about how you always ignore it. The, the, the proper response here would be to say, this, this is how I know to do it. It will work. It will be okay. And, th and to not respond. You all heard the story about the ham? Everybody heard the story about that? I think that's pretty good pastor. You know how the three generations later, you've got to cut the end off like your grandmother says. I don't know why you people do that. But that's what you do, right? And so sometimes, you know, one of the things about those kind of things, my dad would do it this way, is, well, you know, I was using a, a saw that her dad didn't have. It's just like, 
glad your dad would do that. I'm doing it this way. It's going to work. And it did work. It worked too well. They just kept bringing all these dead animals to life. Love it. Right? Her dad didn't fix that, by the way. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By the way, my father-in-law lived with us for 12 years. He just passed away in October. So I have a license after taking care of him for 12 years. Basically. Uh, and I loved him even on his worst day. And so, but no, I think you have to listen and respond. You have to listen. That's the deal. Yeah. No, no, but I would tell you that if this, this cat illustration has been used a lot in our marriage counseling. My wife and I both acknowledge that we both handle it. Um, and that's powerful. Let's take a break. Let's just take a few minutes. I know we could talk all day. Let's just take a break, go to the bathroom, stretch your legs. We'll come back and we'll start with the next.